continue in our study in the Acts of the Apostles. I'm uh, recording this on uh, the 23rd of July 2020. Uh, sadly, it's been a tough week uh, in the uh, family group of our parish, particularly around uh, Christ Church Bestbrook, in that we have had uh, two of our lifelong members of the parish have uh, gone to be with the Lord uh, last weekend. Uh, we buried uh, Dick Adamson and uh, tonight we received the remains of Alan Cummins uh, into the church and his funeral will be held tomorrow. Hence I'm a little behind. I usually have this ready for you on Wednesday. It's now Thursday. Uh, we're also getting ready to go back to church in Mullet Glass on Sunday for our first act of worship. There's a lot going on uh, and our prayers are with uh, Vivian Adamson and her family and with Marie Cummins and her family too at this time. We'll miss them both. We already miss them both uh, in our parish life. Lord, open your word to my heart and my heart to your word in Jesus' name. Last time we looked at Acts chapter 3, uh, we saw... Uh, Peter and uh, John on their way into the temple and they, in the power of Christ and his spirit, healed a beggar. Uh, they've gone on in and people are uh, very curious about what's going on in uh, under, <coughs> excuse me, hay fever in and around them. Here we have Acts chapter 3, verse 11. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power of godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had deci decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One, and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name, and the faith that comes through him, that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed to you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Indeed, all the peoples from Samuel, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are the heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Robust stuff from St. Peter. First thing to note in verse 11 of this is that the man who has been healed through the ministry of Peter and John, the ministry of Christ through Peter and John, is holding on to them. And it's very easy when we have uh, a sense of God in our lives that the people that have been the, the conduit of that blessing, the people who have... Uh, maybe led us into a deeper faith in Christ or have taught us about faith in Christ uh, can uh, be raised 
in our thinking to the position of being heroic. Maybe that's not so bad, but very often we go beyond that and we feel we must hang on to them. We must uh, grip onto that. We often also have a tendency to want to go back to the same experience, go back and revisit that. Why wouldn't this man be hanging on to Peter and John? Why wouldn't he? It's early days. If he's still hanging on to Peter and John in 5, 10 or 15 years time, well then there are issues. But it's a very, very natural response to what has happened. And the people were astonished. That terminology is used uh, a lot. The people are astonished and come running to them. The place that's named as Solomon's Colonnade, it's a, a place in the temple where they are. And they come rushing over to them. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. Again and again and again we must reiterate, I must reiterate, the whole church must reiterate, that any blessing we bring, yes we are God's agents, yes we are God's servants, yes we are ambassadors of the, the good news. Yes, we are ambassadors of the kingdom of God. Yes, we are all those things. Yes, we have tasks to do. We have our role to play. If Peter and John hadn't stepped up, then uh, nothing would have happened. But it is not them. They are not the people who have healed this man. And Peter says it right off from the beginning. When you hear about people who are healers, when you hear about people who have cures, when you hear about people who take and appropriate to themselves the power to do these things, then you're moving away from the norm of Scripture and the standard of Scripture. Peter is very clear that it is God who has done this. It is God who in the name of Jesus has done this. And we talked about this last time. It's in the name of Jesus that he's been healed. Healed. It's been in the name of Jesus and by the power of God that this man is healed. All glory to God. All glory to Jesus. No glory to me. No glory to us. It is very easy to get drawn into a populist mindset. Elsewhere, the scripture says to us, Beware when men speak well of you. It's nice when people speak well of you. It's nice to receive a compliment. And for a long time, as a young uh, person in the ministry of Christ, I'm no longer that young person. As a, a young person in the ministry, I uh, didn't know how to handle it. If somebody said, that was really good. Uh, that was really good the way you looked after my mum's funeral. That was, that was a great sermon, Alan. I, and I, uh, I'm not meant to accept compliments. Of course, it's, it, it's good. Uh, and I generally will say, if, if people are kind enough to say such a thing, I'll generally say to him, thank you for the encouragement, thank you for the support. It means a lot, and it does, and we do need feedback. We all need to be encouraged and drawn along. But it is by God that this man is healed. It is by God that the kingdom goes forward. I want to keep balance in this, because I think I've said this before. Forgive me, I'm getting, turning into an old man, and I'm becoming repetitive. I have said this before, and I'll keep on uh, saying it. There is a mindset that has grown up in the church where people pray prayers like, Lord, we can't do it, you do it. God has given to us a task. Jesus has given to us a task. God has given to us a spirit, not of timidity, but a spirit of courage to go out and do the will, to go and do, be doers of the word, as well as preachers of the world. Do good, do things. It doesn't earn our salvation. We know all that. We're well-versed prods. We know uh, that thought. It doesn't earn us favor with God. The favor with God that God has given us is that he looked upon us with favor in the first place. God looked at us and said, these are worth my son. These are worth everything I have. These children of men that I have created they are worth it. So God has given to us that worth and God has given us his grace of salvation. I can't uh, get myself 
over the hurdle of my own sin. I can't get myself over the hurdle of my own disobedience. But God does that. But he gives to us a task. When we have success in the task of the extension of the kingdom, it's because God is with us by his spirit. God is with us in the name of Jesus. God is with us as he is sovereign over all. And as we uh, forge onwards, as we press forward, as we uh, attain our uh, objectives and leading others to, to faith, we always stop and say, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. That's exactly what Peter says at this point. Why do you stare at us as if it was by our own power and godliness? When I begin to think it's by my power or my godliness or my eloquence, it's not. I am merely the instrument of God. But I must make myself available. And I must engage with God and not sit back in some sort of hyper-Calvinist torpor saying God's going to do it all. We are not fatalists. And God engages us in his mission and seeks that we are obedient to the task that is ours. I think I've laboured my point. Now we enter a rather difficult passage here. Because as Christians we stand in the dock on the issue of anti-Semitism. And um, rightly so. Rightly so. Very often the church has been implicated. And you would be astonished among the church fathers among the reformers uh, and among people in every generation of the church, the people who have uh, fed the fuel of anti-Semitism. It's a matter of great personal shame to me that this should be the case. And it's a matter of shame for the church that sh this should be the case. We are not called to be anti-Jewish. We are not called ever to hate any group of people of whatever race, ethnicity or background. Hatred, bigotry and all those negative ideas are not of the spirit of Christ. Nor should they be in my humanity. If I was, a, if I was an atheist, I should not think that way anyway. So in the enhanced state of the human spirit in relationship with God in Christ, there is no place for anti-Semitism. Sometimes people have gone back and said, well, the roots of it are to be found in the New Testament. And I'm cautious about that because these writers, well, this writer is a, is a Gentile, but these speakers are Jews themselves. It becomes complex. Uh, people say they're self-loathing and, and things like that. I don't think they are. I think simply here we have a record. And please, if, if you or one of my Jewish brothers and sisters, uh, forgive me if I'm feeding something and contact me and uh, I will repent if I, if I uh, in any way hint uh, at anything that, that is untoward. It is not my purpose or my heart at all. Quite simply, Peter becomes quite strident here. And we as Christians have to accept this stridency. Are we called upon to approve of everything he says? Some schools of thought would say, yes, we are. Or do we raise an eyebrow and say, oh, steady there, Peter. I think we give Peter a certain amount of understanding because he is still raw. The crucifixion and these things are only a few weeks in the past. Uh, the betrayal of Judas, uh, the conspiracy of the hierarchy. And I do accept, and I think we, we, it's all right to accept. I can accept that, you know, Protestant clerics, Christian clerics, uh, church officials have conspired to do the wrong thing from time to time. I think uh, that's the case in every religion, in Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and everywhere. And they got it badly wrong. They got it badly wrong. And Peter's going back over it for the second time. That some of my Christian brethren have used this as a springboard to anti-Semitism is the flaw. And some people say, well, it, it's a shame it's there at all. Well, it is. And I have to work with that with an honesty of in, and an integrity of intellect and spirit 
as well. I don't say it as anti-Semitic, and you might say, well, you would say that, Alan, wouldn't you? But I don't say it as anti-Semitic. I do say it as critical, and I do say it as one fairly uh, strident Jewish man taking it to another group of Jewish people. But it is no springboard to uh, evil, I hope. Uh, Debate it with me, if you will. I will be utterly reasonable to your thoughts on it if you disagree. He goes over the handing over. Uh, sorry, I, I'll just tick back slightly as he gets into this. He said, it wasn't us that did this. He said, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, uh, Jesus. Peter, Jewish man from Galilee, uh, underlined that he stands in the ethnic and religious tradition of the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are referred to as the patriarchs. There are other uh, patriarchs as well, but they are referred to most commonly as the patriarchs. They are the founders. Abraham, to whom the covenant was given in it, its various forms and coming together in the covenant of circumcision, uh, Isaac his son and Jacob his grandson, whose name was also Israel. Okay, so he grounds it and roots it, and we should ground and root our faith in the idea that we are inheritors, the spiritual inheritors of uh, the great uh, faithfulness and obedience of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Read them. Go back to Genesis and read about them. People who tell you that they have a New Testament faith and say, you know, as, as if there, there is no Old Testament uh, are lost. If you don't know who Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are, then you're struggling with this. You're struggling to see who Jesus was. You're struggling to get any context or handle on any of this. So he's, he, he, he's ru running into a confrontation here. I think he's quite willfully running into a confrontation here because he wants to get across uh, his point. Um, let's not take that away from, from Peter in our anxiety to deal with the question of, of anti-Semitism, he's not afraid of the scrap. He's not afraid of the argument. But the rabbinic school is an argumentative school. Uh, and uh, he, he throws himself in here and he roots his thoughts in the God of Abraham, Isaac, of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. Then he goes over how they... Uh, handed him over to be killed. Uh, they went before Pilate. He was disowned by you. A murderer was released. You killed the author of life, uh, but God raised him from the dead. If you want to be strictly accurate, the Romans killed him. But, uh, you know, Charles Manson was uh, sent to prison uh, by the good work of Vince Bugliosi, uh, the assistant district attorney uh, in uh, California in the late 60s, early 70s, and he wasn't deemed to necessarily have been present just in proximity to the act, uh, that, uh, the deed that was done. So let us, uh, if you're in proximity, what's it called? Joint enterprise. Joint enterprise. There was joint enterprise. But the Romans were the guys who, who, who did the deed. But there's joint enterprise, certainly. You kill the author of life. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given the complete healing to him. That you can all see. Peter's point, heavy-handed in the making of the point, I would argue, but Peter's point nonetheless is, to come back where he started, it is in Jesus' name, and this is unique. And there is no doubt that there is an inevitable clash, theologically, theologically, between those who wish to maintain a traditional Jewish course and the emerging Christian movement. And the teaching of Jesus. When Jesus says things like, I and the Father are one, it immediately uh, runs in the face of the 
the steadfast monotheism of Judaism. And when Peter reiterates this, that it is by Jesus' name, the authoritative name given by God in this circumstance for the healing, and he goes on for, for salvation as well, it runs into mono, the monotheistic thought. And that's the clash. That's the clash. Many of these early believers we've seen at Pentecost, all the apostles, all the original followers of Jesus, or most of them, and all the people who were converted at Pentecost, or most of them, are Jews. They're, they're Jewish. Peter never stopped being Jewish. John never stopped being Jewish. Paul never stopped being Jewish. You can't. You're ethnically Jewish. And they see and we learn from them, we download from them this perception that we are inheritors of the Abraham, Isaac and Jacob uh, salvation history story and that Jesus is the, the capstone, the cornerstone of this whole idea. So brothers and sisters, he says to them, it is by Jesus and there you have the crossover. This is where the spark is going to be theologically. It spills over into nastiness uh, in this story as we will see. Uh, and it spills over into nastiness in the life of Jesus. We must acknowledge that. But in the acknowledging of difference and conflict, do we have to adopt a position of enmity, bigotry, persecution and hatefulness? No, we don't. No, we don't. Okay, so I stand by the theological position. I'm a Christian priest and minister. Okay, I stand by it. Absolute, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> and that. But we must walk a, a, a line of care, caution, love and generosity. Now, brothers, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. <clears throat> this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold. And again, he roots... When you see uh, people talk about uh, the scripture, they very often talk about the law and the prophets, or the patriarchs, the law and the prophets. And he now references Moses, and Moses is the representative of the law. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. A, a, a Jewish scholar may take another line on that or may accept that it's a messianic statement. We do. We immediately, and Peter intends that comparison to be a messianic statement. This is the Messiah whom Moses talked about. So he's referenced Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He's referencing Moses and Moses, the lawgiver, is also speaking prophetically here. And he talks about how all the prophets, are talking about Jesus. Now we would go back in our understanding of the Old Testament and we'll go through the major prophets and the minor prophets and say, well, there it is. <clears throat> Others may say, well, you're fishing for it and you'll find it. And fair enough, I don't agree with you, but I think it's there. I know it's there. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made to your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. He says, And you are heirs of the prophets. You are heirs of this truth. You are heirs of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Covenant heirs. That's a theological idea, but it's a, it's a real idea that God made a covenant with Abraham. A promise, a link. God wove himself into the life of Abraham and his descendants, beginning with Isaac and then Jacob, Joseph, and so on. And the law comes, and then the prophets come. And Peter, in these few paragraphs, in these few sentences, has woven the story of this uh, Jesus is Messiah, fulfilled prophet, fulfilling prophet, 
son of the covenant, son of the patriarchs, son of the law, and he is the righteous one. You rejected him, but you can make amends for that. You can put that right. And if we have to, and only if we have to, speak in a very pointed or strident way. When I was a young uh, guy, Chippers, I'm starting to sound like a real old bloke, aren't I? You know, when I was a young fella, you know, uh, <laughs> you kind of think you have to be, you know, pointing a finger. And a friend of mine calls Northern Ireland, and he's a Balamina man himself, Northern Ireland evangelistic preachers, he calls them squeakers. He says, because they all squeak when they're dull. And I felt they had to be a, had to have squeaky theology. Those who know him know him. You know, they had to have that sort of sort of approach to things and they had to say tough, daring things. Actually, there's a lot of psychology and uh, Christian preachers trying to make themselves big guys, big fellas, fellas in clerical collars, you know, fellas in clerical collars with Bibles, walking around like they're Wyatt Earp. You know, and everybody has to dodge them. And, you know, I'm the Terminator or whatever. You know, and, and there is that danger that we get this tough guy, macho sort of uh, uh, gospel. And we have to be careful of it. That we don't just say things for shock. Shock jock preaching. Okay. And I felt I had to do it a wee bit when I was younger. Definitely did. Uh, and sometimes we have to say the pointed thing. I actually think the church has lost the right to say an awful lot about morals at the minute. Somebody probably come along and whack me around the ankles for that. But I do. I, boys, have we blotted our copybook, including anti-Semitism and racism and slavery and all those things. We have a, a lot to, to say to God in terms of repentance and a lot to say to God in terms of uh, to our fellow human beings in terms of repentance. Uh, men, women, uh, people of every colour, uh, ethnicity, every sexual nature, every person that we have been uh, nasty about, and we have, and that includes our Jewish brothers and sisters, we need to, to iron it out. Shock, jock, Christianity needs to back off and remember that we are the ambassadors of the King of Love. The King of Love my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. Those gentle words. He is the God of the tender compassion and love for humanity. And we are to become like him. So he has said some fairly harsh things. Perhaps he had the right to say them in the context. He has rooted it all in the context of who he is. And who these people are that he's having this uh confrontation with the confrontation goes on into the next chapter uh, and we can see that this confrontation is building it, it's getting it's it's there is a tension growing up here so some of the principles i've laid down today i will take for granted that we have accepted them i will refer back because people might just drop in on a, a different bible study but there is always in this the putting to the fore of Jesus. That's our task. To put Jesus to the forefront of our teaching, our preaching, our ministry, our lives, our way of being with other people. There is no other name. There is no other person. There is no other purpose to the church other than to glorify God. His Son, Jesus Christ, and done in and through and by the power of God, the Holy Spirit. Loving God, we lay before you all our weaknesses. We bring before you all our sin. We bring before you all our disobedience. All our bigotry, prejudice, hard-heartedness and anger towards our fellow human beings. We lay them before you, Lord, in repentance and ask your forgiveness as we ask forgiveness 
of all those whom we may have hurt as individuals, as communities, and as followers in the way of Christ. Forgive us, Lord, when we have misrepresented you in any way. We give thanks to you for your grace and forgiveness. May we approach all the people whom we meet in life with love, compassion, generosity and the Spirit of Christ. We pray again for Vivian and for Marie who have lost their life's partners in this week. Be with them, O Lord, in the healing of their hearts and with all those who have lost loved ones through this time of pestilence and pain. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Mulliglass Parish Church, St. Luke's Mulliglass, recommence worship in church, God willing, this Sunday. And we meet at 10 a.m. I would ask that members of other churches do not crowd in as we need to get used to social distancing in church. Let's gather slowly. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.